I'm going to talk about the dual legacy of Leibniz's theory of appetition. Is this audible in the back? Okay, good. Um, if you've uh, made a study of Leibniz, uh, none of what I have to say will be unfamiliar. No, it's all been explained many times before. Um, so my contribution in that case is uh, simply trying to organize the material in such a way that the influence on later thinking and reaction to it is um, quite visible. So uh, I'm going to talk... Um, paper divided into uh, three, three parts first being the longest. Uh, first, I'll talk about Leibniz on force and appetite in physics and metaphysics, and then say a bit about uh, Buffon's reaction to this. Um, Buffon is, of course, not a, a German philosopher, but widely read in Germany thanks to translations that appeared um, almost immediately after the publication of the Histoire Naturelle. And uh, then finally, I'll say a little bit about uh, Raimaris and his extensions and modifications in the um, Vornehmischen Wahrheiten and uh, his uh, book about the Triebe der Tiere from 1760. Even though he's younger than Buffon, I put him afterwards because he's clearly reacting to much of what Buffon had to say. So... Starting with Leibniz, um, general features of Leibniz's metaphysics. On one hand, there are lots and lots of uh, uses of the concept of force and appetite and a vocabulary of autonomy, spontaneity, and perfectibility applying to many, many regions of discourse, physics, metaphysics, psychology, embryology. On the other hand, um, uh, there's the claim that individual destinies and general destinies, what's going to happen to the whole world, has been ordained by God and fixed for all time through the choice of individual substances. And there's also, in uh, contrast to all the vocabulary of autonomy and spontaneity, a denial of soul-body interaction and an assertion of mechanism implying an effective denial of free will, even though there are little roundabout attempts to explain some concept of free will. And <clears throat> generation for Leibniz is just the mechanical growth of a preformed and pre existent organism with no need to invoke special formative forces. So why does Leibniz say this? Well, he thinks that uh, if substances were not the sources of their own activity, Spinoza would have been right. God would have been the only substance in the universe. That has bad consequences, he thinks. And uh, a blind, fatal necessity would have governed everything. And uh, he even sees this threat in Cartesian physics, even while uh, Descartes seemed to exalt human free will in the meditations, um, uh, there's a lot of moral passivity in Descartes. Um, Leibniz thought that uh, um, Cartesian metaphysics imply that you just wait for the next thing to happen according to providence. So why does he think this? Well, just backing up a bit, Descartes banishes forces with some ambiguity, powers and virtues and physiological souls from the theory of nature. Um, I say there is some ambiguity because Descartes' position on causality is, uh, is a little bit unclear. He does sometimes talk about bodies as possessing force or transferring portions of their speed to one another. But sometimes he seems to talk as an occasionalist, as though God has just recreated the universe in uh, different configurations from moment to moment. Um, but uh, in many passages, he suggests that to be in motion is not to be pushed or pulled by a force, but just to change one's position relative to other bodies. 
And there's a sort of uh, exaggerated version of this in Malbranche. Uh, Malbranche decides that God is the only active agent in the universe on pain of idolatry. Uh, this goes back to medieval theorizing Islamic philosophy, for one thing, in which, um, in this exaggerated version, God is just recreating the universe. There's no active power in anything, not even the human will. Um, all that's up to God. So Leibniz is going to contest that. Um, so Malbranche even claims no one can move his arm by himself or do good or evil or speak a single syllable. We are motionless and dead unless God comes to our aid. And um, Spinoza maintains that individuals, including persons, are only modes of a single divine substance. So they don't have, according to Leibniz, uh, any substantial individuality themselves, and that's unacceptable. But at the same time, in this uh, early modern philosophy, there are many references to a um, quite different picture of what's, what's happening, um, references to conatus, effort, striving, and teleology. The old Aristotelian notion that um, natural things must be acting for an end, um, animate and maybe even inanimate objects um, must be doing so, and that visible change in nature and lawfulness requires efficacy in individual things. So Hobbes, as you remember, makes appetite, desire, and even competitive and malicious exercise of power central to his political anthropology. And Spinoza, uh, despite this modes theory and his determinism, makes a drive for self-preservation and even accumulation of power in all individual modes quite central to his anthropology. So <clears throat> appetite, in the jargon of late scholastic physics, is a very well-established concept um, employed to describe not only a thing's attraction to its natural place in cosmology, but um, also animal appetite, which is divided into various sorts, you know, desire, um, irritability, and intellectual and rational appetite or will. So um, in attacking the occasionalist Sturm in his paper De Ipsa Natura, uh, rather than attacking Malbranche, whom uh, Leibniz was much friendlier to, um, Leibniz insists quite canonically for him that if there are laws of nature, um, God must make these efficacious by leaving some vestige of him expressed in things. There must be a certain efficacy residing in things, a form or force, such as we usually designate by the name of nature, from which the series of phenomena follows. So a very concise and eloquent statement of that. So in um, Leibniz's metaphysics, matter could not be merely extension, as Descartes thought. Uh, there would be no source of cohesion. I don't think uh, Leibniz himself ever really solved the problem of cohesion or seriously grappled with it. Um, but he did uh, look at rebound and inertia and vis viva, and so came up with a fairly well articulated theory of active and passive forces in bodies, beginning with the brief demonstration of 1684, in which he tried to show that um, um, this viva is conserved in experiments with falling bodies. This was not original. Huygens had also uh, shown this um, before Leibniz, but he took this to be conclusive proof that the Cartesian theory of matter as pure extension had to be wrong. Uh, one had to impute force and it had to be um, conserv conserved, not merely quantity of motion, but force and later direction of force, which made the Cartesian theory of soul-body interaction physically impossible. So 
There are these Leibnizian atoms of nature, which are incorporeal, hence indestructible, hence soul-like, and invisible because they are unextended. They have experiences and appetites, and somehow they serve the same function that corporeal atoms do in the systems of the corpuscularians. They somehow ground the appearances, um, but there's some way of uh, overcoming um, the boundary between the invisible and unextended and the visible and extended, which is, of course, not explained. So um, Leibniz thought that he, um, he was uh, rehabilitating some scholastic notion of substantial form, um, adding substantial form to matter, um, but he uh, treats bodies as phenomena, but substantial, robust phenomena, not illusions, not like the rainbow, as he says. And they have some kind of active and passive force, so that on these um, different levels, there are analogies and echoes of forward striving forces. Um, you see this, he claims, in shortest root teleology. His best example there is, uh, first example there is Snell's Law, which says that uh, in a light ray passing from one medium to another takes the most efficient route. Um, the uh, same concept, he thinks, is there in the appetite of the invisible monads that are pulled to their next perception. Um, we see it in appetite, desire, and will in living organisms, in the developmental impulse in seeds, the chrysalis of the uh, larva, in the development of spermatic animalcules, um, we see it in the developmental forward movement in the moral world in which there's more enlightenment, more science, more culture, uh, more justice. This is discussed in the theodicy. And in the way in which the mind strives for equilibrium after little upsets and disturbances. He talks about that in the new essays. And... Um, in the way in which, in some of the more esoteric writings, the possible substances strive to become actual, and that's the way the world is formed. Possible substances in the mind of God struggling to exist uh, along with the others. So all living things, according to text of 1690, have not only a body, but also a soul. And... Um, this claim is upheld in the new essays. There is perception and appetition even in plants, as far as Leibniz is concerned, because of the analogy holding between plants and animals. And human happiness is uh, always um, a struggle. Um, tranquility is an elusive ideal, as Hobbes as well claimed, um, in which... In tranquility, nothing is left to desire which would dull our minds, um, but in perpetual progress to new pleasures and new perfections. In discussing Locke's doctrine of unease, um, to which Leibniz is very sympathetic, um, Leibniz describes this tendency of the mind and body to restore a disturbed equilibrium. It's as though the pendulum of a clock is disturbed, but it tries to uh, restore itself. Our impulses are like so many little springs that re try to release themselves and make our machine go. But at the same time, um, along with all these images of activity and spontaneity and forward motion, um, there are restrictions and qualifications that make Leibniz into a somewhat old-fashioned, certainly by 18th century standards, mechanical philosopher. So he claims that the uh, corpuscularian Cartesian physics, even the Gassendist physics of mechanical interactions, is basically theoretically adequate to all animal, human, and human physiology. 
There are no occult forces to be permitted in physics, including attraction. Um, at one point, he sort of reluctantly accepts the Newtonian account of uh, universal attraction as saving the cosmological phenomena. Um, but as long as it uh, merely governs the appearances and um, is sort of a, a way of, of predicting things rather than ontologically basic. There's no mind-body interaction, just the pre-established harmony of a dual series of physiological events, mechanically explicable and predictable, and a series of mental events, the desire and perception, um, all of this implied in God's choice of the individual substance. So there's total predictability of the future, including human actions in principle. And in a very interesting passage, uh, Leibniz says that um, a person, a human person, could make a machine which was capable of walking around town for a time and turning precisely at the corners of certain streets. And an, a, a more perfect mind, still a limited mind, doesn't have to be God's, could make a machine that would foresee and avoid um, a vastly greater number of obstacles. And so, he says, um, if the world were, as some think it is, only a combination of a finite number of atoms which interact in accord with mechanical laws, it is certain that a finite mind could understand and predict with certainty everything that will happen in a given period. Um, it's really quite an extraordinary uh, thought um, because Leibniz seems to be entertaining the possibility as a backup that uh, maybe the world just is a combination of atoms ruled by uh, material, by mechanical laws, which of course is completely contradictory to his official metaphysics. So um, the alleged spontaneity of substances, their autonomy and freedom from determination by external stimuli, turns out to be something of a trick, um, at least when it comes to thinking about free will and the efficacy of decisions. Um, Leibniz assures us that we alone are the source of all our actions, since our souls can't be determined by any external entity or force. Um, everything that happens to a substance is a consequence of its concept or its being. Um, but uh, you can't deviate from your own foreordained script. When it comes to the uh, human-animal divide, Leibniz has continuity to some extent. All organisms perceive, feel, and act, although some do so drowsily, some do so clearly and intellectually. All organisms are naturally immortal, so that goes for all the plants as well as all the animals, uh, because souls are always found in conjunction with bodies. And uh, Leibniz's account of death and immortality is just that the soul uh, becomes attached to a very, very small portion of matter in the same way that it was attached before birth. And um, someday this very small portion of matter may grow again into a full organism, uh, but that's not assured by philosophy. And human beings act like the beasts as simple empirics in three quarters of their actions. So there's some stress on um, human-animal continuity uh, in, in contrast to the Cartesian tradition. On the other hand, there is a lot of emphasis on discontinuity. Only humans know necessary and eternal truths. Only humans reflect on themselves, have self-awareness, apperception, and knowledge of God. Only humans understand God's works through science. And humans have a creative power that is analogous to God's. Our soul is like an architect in its voluntary actions, and also in its involuntary actions, um, its inventiveness in dreams. 
Uh, Leibniz mentions this in, in quite a few places. In dreams, we effortlessly invent things which one would have to ponder long to come upon when awake. It says in, in dreams, and maybe just before falling asleep, he has these visions of complicated architecture, uh, what we now think of as hypnagogic imagery, which can indeed be fantastically geometrical. And this was obviously um, you know, quite a striking psychological phenomenon for him. So knowledge of eternal and necessary truths distinguishes us from the rest of the animals, and um, that's what the rational soul is capable of doing. And windowlessness for Leibniz, metaphysically, individual substances do not interact, so they cannot damage or destroy one another. And even on the empirical level, um, there's almost a sense of living individuals not that they don't interact with one another, but they're not explicitly theorized as such. So if you think about Leibniz's imagery of um, living things, it's really quite different from Descartes. You remember uh, Descartes' discussion of the sheep and the wolf um, in the uh, treatise of um, in the uh, treatise of light, I think it is. Maybe it's also in the. Uh, in the discourse, but um, the, the light impulses from the wolf act on the sheep's eye, which opens valves in the brain, and as a result, the legs of the sheep move and it runs away. Well, we have clear interaction between two organisms. Um, in Leibniz's living world imagery, we have fish swimming around in a pond, and in the water between the fish, it's also full of organisms, and in the water between those smaller organisms, they're even smaller ones, but they all just seem to be swimming around undisturbed by all the others. Forever until God annihilates them in their little spaces, rather than pursuing, attacking, consuming, displacing, and doing things like that. So um, in Cartesian world, um, oh, the sheep and the wolf are competing for survival in a demanding and dangerous world, and they were outfitted with a set of inbuilt automatic reactions for preserving their entirely contingent lives. Okay, let's see where I am. Um, good, so uh, on to uh, Buffon. Um, extensions and revisions of this general Leibnizian picture in 1749 to 54. That is the period of uh, the first um, three volumes of the natural history and its uh, translation into German, 1751. Buffon has numerous references to the creator, but the creator might just as well be nature. Knowledge derives only from the study of phenomena. Um, there is absolutely no need for rationalistic metaphysics in Buffon's view. Nature is chaotic, a vast field of harmonies and disharmonies. And Buffon recognizes the expansion of scientifically respectable resident powers and forces, uh, attraction, electricity, magnetism, and um, other ones, penetrating forces that act on the whole substance of bodies. Um, why should we reject them, he says, um, as long as we uh, have actual experience of the effects they are known to produce? Um, why employ only the power of impulsion? Um, nature is a living power, immense, embracing everything, animating everything, a work perpetually alive. Time, space, and matter are her means, Buffon says, the universe her object, movement and life her purpose. And when it comes to life, mind, and matter, uh, there's a dualistic ontology of indestructible units of brute matter and indestructible units of living matter, 
animals. I'm just going to use animals for non-human animals, just keeps it simple. Animals are purely material beings, no souls attached. Um, Humans are, he says, endowed with a ray of the divine, a soul, but the soul is treated as a set of functions rather than as a thing. And there's absolutely no discussion anywhere in uh, in the uh, natural history of immortality, a little concession to the Sorbonne that had criticized a number of theses. Um, But uh, the usual preoccupation of philosophers in the immortality of the soul is completely missing. And Buffon says, uh, despite the human superficial similarity to the ape, Um, including where his brain is concerned, the human being does have a soul, um, but he never tries to explain the difference between ape and human um, in terms of an incorporeal substance uh, implanted in it. And he really does hint that maybe there's some invisible difference in the brain of the ape and the brain of the human, accounting for all the capabilities that humans have, Um, It may just be too small to be seen uh, because we don't see any difference in the brains of idiots and regular people. On the human-animal divide, uh, Buffon says that animals have sensations and experiences, but they don't reflect, compare ideas, plan for the future, reminisce or reason. Um, He even says they can't distinguish their dreams from reality. Whatever they've dreamed uh, has, as far as they're concerned, actually happened. Very implausible view. Um, They exhibit complex behavior, but this is accomplished through purely material mechanisms. They are automata animated by a vital force. And as I mentioned, um, the ape is similar, even though there are profound dissimilarities in capabilities and temperament. So um, the, the unmoving, unconscious sleeping animal, like the oyster, is a relatively simple machine. Um, but every animal that can move experiences desires. And uh, that seems to be an uptake on Leibniz's notion of appetition. Yeah. Um, Experiences arise from the state of the material machine. This can't be explained um, in the same way that the eye can't see itself or the finger can't touch itself. The mind can't explain how it comes to have experiences and, and desires. Nevertheless, they are perfectly capable of arising from the machine. The animals invent nothing, they perfect nothing, they always do the same thing in the same way, the old Cartesian claim. Um, They even, Buffon says, um, uh, have no instincts. Uh, Their attention to their offspring follows from familiarity with them. In other words, everything follows either through learning or from um, mechanical um, inbuilt patterns. which he doesn't want to consider as instinct. And although elephants, beavers, apes, and monkeys um, have complex social behavior, seeking one another out, congregating, moving in troops, caring for one another, their societies like the bees depend only on universal mechanism and laws of movement established by the creator. There is an interesting exception in 1760 Um, the beavers, Um, in this discussion of the domestication of animals. um, Buffon argues that um, the other animals have become degraded through domestication. Uh, They've lost their um, primitive abilities, and this has happened even with wild animals. With domestic animals, we have to distinguish between the creature of God with its instincts, there he seems to accept instincts, and the enslaved animal subjected to our breeding and training. But many wild species also have lost their natural talents. The beavers, he says, seem to have retained some trace of the ancient intelligence of brutes. In 
In um, the uh, Discourse on the Nature of Animals, there's a very forceful depiction of appetition in humans. Um, here he says if, you, if, a, if a person wanted to reach an object and uh, found themselves deprived painlessly, presumably, of their limbs, you take away their legs, they try to get it with their arms, you take away their... Um, uh, take away their arms, uh, they will sort of wriggle towards it. Um, a person would drag himself by his chin or his teeth, even if we reduce his body to the size of a physical point, an atom. If the desire is still present, he will employ all his forces to change his position. So, uh, on to Ramaris, extensions and deviations of basic Leibnizian dichotomy. Um, Weimaris, as you know, is a virulent critic of Christianity, both the Old and New Testaments. But he's also a critic of Epicurean materialism, as represented by Lamétrie, Maupertuis, and Buffon. His project is to defend the special and providential creation of animals, and the means to doing so is to argue that postnatal learning is inadequate to explain the range and complexity of species sustaining animal behavior. And he has three general sets of uh, triba. This is all. Um, very nicely explained in uh, John Zemito's recent book on uh, German physiology and uh, life science. So there's the, um, now the um, Leibnizian uh, um, um, representation faculty has become a Triebe, the Vorstellungstriebe, which is a drive to be conscious of the world and the state of its own body on the part of the animal. And there's the Willkurtriebe, appetite, a striving for pleasure and satisfaction that motivates the animal. And then there are a whole range of Kunsttriebe, um, animal skills, burrowing, nest building, courtship, parenting and migration that support the animal's harmonious and continued existence. And the powers of matter, says Raimaris against Buffon, could never explain um, the Triebe, especially the Kunsttriebe. And Leibniz's pre-established harmony is unacceptable. Animal experience and motivation together with divinely implanted instinct causes animal behavior. There are some echoes, nevertheless, of, Reima, of Leibniz in Reimaris. The world, he says, consists entirely of powers that act in it. The clashing powers are brought to a congruity, thanks to God, and harmonize against Buffon. All animals are ensouled. They have ideas, imagination, and memory, again, against Buffon. And all animals have an internal end attainable by their natural powers. So Leibnizian teleology again. Um, but only human skills are practiced with intelligence and permit innovation. Lacking reflection and speech, the other animals cannot investigate art, science, and morality, which is pretty much the, the uh, universal consensus. So summing up here, um, persisting controversies of the dual legacy, all of which are discussed by Kant, um, First, what non-mechanical forces, for example, a Bildungstrieb, can be allowed into science to explain morphology generation? Second, can active incorporeal entities be philosophically, if not empirically, demonstrated? All those forces of nature that seem to be acting within matter, uh, but can't be directly perceived, only their effects. As causes, they have to be inferred. Third, uh, is the world harmonious and designed, or could a materialist Epicurean system of perishing, with nature working by trial and error on random combinations, explain adaptations? The adapted beings are just the ones that are left over after all the others have failed. 
um, and uh, even, even uh, the existence of self-reproducing organisms. Could that just be a matter of successful combinations that turned out to be able to do that? Uh, fourth, what is the most reasonable alternative to the theory of the pre-established harmony of body and soul? Um, some kind of influx theory or, or what? And um, finally, if uh, all behavior, including human behavior, is causally determined and in principle predictable, what are the consequences for law and morality? Major preoccupation of Kant's. Good. So I will end there. Thank you very much. <laughs>